Study the Bible to be wise. Believe in it to be safe. And practice it to be holy. The mirror of God's word is painfully clear. Therefore, either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Our topic tonight is the new covenant. The new covenant. What do we mean by the new covenant? As we understand, covenant is an agreement. Covenant is a pledge. Covenant is a pact. What do we mean by new covenant? With whom is this new covenant made? What are the conditions that surround this new covenant? When will be the fulfillment of this covenant? All this and more we are going to dig tonight. The new covenant is the last of the Bible covenant that God made with his people. This covenant has much to do with the events of the last days of this world. We are going to divide it into five to understand about this very new covenant. We're going to divide it into five divisions. First, the nation with whom the new covenant is made. Secondly, the provisions of the new covenant. Thirdly, the time of the fulfillment of this new covenant. Fourthly, the relationship of the church to the new covenant. Fifthly, the eschatological implications of the new covenant are the Old Testament prophecies of the new covenant implications. So let's turn from the first one. The nation with whom the new covenant is made. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 31 through 34. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all know, shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive the iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Here the Lord declared that he is entering into a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. There's not going to be like the covenant that he entered with their father, which they broke. But it's going to be a new covenant. This new covenant was made with the same people with whom the Lord made the old covenant. The old covenant of the law was made with nation of Israel only. And this new covenant is also made with nation of Israel, not with the church, as we read. This new covenant is important in the life of God's people. That's why he says... It's not going to be like the covenant that he made when he took them out of the land of Egypt. Even though he was a husband to them, but they broke their, their covenant. But this is the covenant that God will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, that he will let his word be in their mind and to be written in their hearts. 
whereby they will know what it means to follow the Lord. Today, there are many people who don't even care about the word of God. They don't have time to read through the word of God. They don't have time even to meditate upon God's word. But we forget what the Bible told us in the book of Joshua chapter 1. In verse 8, says, let this book of the law not be taken away from you, but you shall meditate upon it day and night. Then comes the progress and success. Many people want success in life. They want progress, but they are not willing to study the word of God or learn of it. So the new covenant is made with the house of Israel. Secondly, what are the provisions of the new covenant? We need to know them. The new covenant provides restoration. It provides restoration. Restoration of God's favor and blessings. At a time, you can read the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. Jeremiah 32, verse 41. Isaiah 61, verse 8 through 9. But we are going to read Ezekiel. Come with me in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, verse 25 through 27. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land. And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land, and they shall show. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. You see what the Bible said that God says? There will be showers of blessings. The wild beasts will cease in the land and the Lord will make a provision for them in the wood where they will stay safely. These are the blessings that God will release. The trees will yield its fruit and the earth shall yield its increase whereby it will be fertile. There will be no more anything called famine but there will be abundance of God's blessings in the form of fruit and increase of the land. Secondly, this new covenant comes about also with forgiveness of sin. The Lord will forgive the sin of his people. In the book of Ezekiel 31, look at verse 34. Ezekiel 31, 34. Uh, sorry, Jeremiah 31, 34, please. Jeremiah 31, verse 34. It says, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, say the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Forgiveness of sin completely. There will be forgiveness of sin. At the time you can read Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 through 12. There will be forgiveness of sin. The sins of the people will be completely forgiven, says the Lord. He will not remember their sin anymore. He will not call them to remembrance anymore. Thirdly, this covenant also carried the promise of impartation of new mind and heart. New mind and new heart. In the book of Isaiah 59, look at verse 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from you, your mouth, not from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. 
There'll be impartation of anointing of new mind and heart. There'll be new heart, new mind. Our mind will not be a polluted mind anymore, but a renewed mind. Our heart will not be a corrupt mind. Our heart will not be a corrupt heart anymore, but be a transformed heart. That's what the Bible says. That's what this very covenant brings about. So we become a complete change people, people who are only looking unto our Messiah, unto our Lord. Fourthly, this covenant also brings about provision for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That will be outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36, look at verse 27. I will pour my spirit within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgment and do them. There will be outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the people at that time. The Spirit of God will be there to enable us to live according to God's order, to maintain God's statutes, to maintain uprightness, justice, and not injustice. To live life that pleases God. Life that brings glory to his name. Life that only God alone be glorified. Today you can see many people who claim to be Christians, but our life is just a mess. Our life brings reproach to the name of the Lord. Somebody is called a Christian, but when he talks to you, you begin to wonder what kind of Christian that person is. It will not be like that that time. That time, the output of the Holy Ghost, man's word will be the same, yea, be yea, no, be no. There will be divine ability to do things according to God's standard, and the word has spoken. Fifthly, this covenant brought about the manifestation of the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. There will be tremendous manifestation of teaching through the Holy Spirit, as we saw in the book of Jeremiah 31. Look at verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, says the Lord. You see what it says? You see, the Holy Spirit begins to teach us. The divine teacher will teach us what to do. We begin to know the Lord beyond how we used to know him before, in a greater measure, because of the power of the Holy Spirit in manifestation, teaching us how to follow the Lord according to his perfect will. So that will be outpouring of the Holy Ghost and teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit to God's people. Next. This covenant also brought about the provision of the building of the sanctuary in Jerusalem, in the book of Ezekiel, a moment, chapter 37, Ezekiel, chapter 37, look at verse 26 through 28. It brings about the rebuilding of the sanctuary of God, the tabernacle of God. Ezekiel 37, verse 26 through 28. It says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel. When my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Look at that. The building of God's sanctuary. God will release his sanctuary in the midst of his people and the tabernacle of God will be rebuilt in the midst of his people and every nation will know that the Lord has been sanctified in the midst of Israel. That's what the Bible says. Next. Also the Bible told us this very particular covenant brought about cessation of war. There will be peace. Peace shall reign. At the time you can read the book of Hosea chapter 2 verse 8. But let's go to the book of Isaiah. A moment. Again. Isaiah chapter 2. 
Isaiah chapter 2, look at verse 4. It says, He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword again against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. See what it says. There will be no more war. There will be no more war, no more fighting. There will be peace all over the world at that time. There will be peace. There will be no more war, no rumors of war. No war. No nation will rise up against the other nation anymore. This is what the Bible says. And this will come to pass. They will know no more war. And next, the blood of Jesus Christ is the foundation of this blessing of the new covenant. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that brought all this about. And this will come to fulfillment as God's people continue to follow him, as the Bible told us in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11. Now let's look at the time of the fulfillment of this new covenant. You may ask the question, when will this new covenant be fulfilled? the time of its fulfillment. The Old Testament prophets viewed it as future, and definitely it is future. It is not something that's going to happen now, but it will be future. The Bible declared in the book of Hosea, chapter 2. A moment in the book of Hosea, chapter 2. Look at verse 18 through 20. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the earth, and with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle. I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safety, safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will, and you shall know the Lord. This talks about future as God deals with the land of Israel. At the time, you can read Isaiah 55, verse 3, Ezekiel 16, verse 60 through 62, and Ezekiel 20, verse 37. It is still future because this covenant is still future because it must follow the return of Christ at the second advent. That's why it's future. All the blessings anticipated in the new covenant will not be realized until Israel's salvation. The salvation followed the return of the deliverer, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This covenant will be realized in the millennial age. Millennial age. When Christ will rule this planet Earth for 1,000 years without interruption. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. Isaiah, chapter 11. Look at verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with a young goat. The calf and the young lion and a fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall grave, graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the wind child shall put his head in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So that's how it's going to be. Because at that time, millennial age of Christ, rule of Christ, no power of devil can operate because Christ is in charge for 1,000 years. Nothing will hurt one another. No fighting. No wars. Because Christ is on the throne. 
during that time. Christ will rule this planet Earth for 1,000 years. And you and I are going to rule with him. That's why we are encouraging everyone, as the Bible told us in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, we are preaching, warning everyone to present everyone perfect before God so that you will not be left behind. This world is not your own, and it's not your home. This place we are just passing by. One day this world will just go off that way. That's why we are warning everyone to turn around to God so that when the trumpet sounds, as the Bible told us in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, from verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, the moment the trumpet of God is sound, that you will not be left behind. Those who are dead in Christ will rise first as Christ comes with the voice of the archangel. Then we who are alive will join them soon. And so we shall be with the Lord in the clouds. Before we enter into the holy wedding. That is why it's important that you begin to think about your life. Take stock of your life, the kind of life you live. Money takes you nowhere. Money can only purchase what money can purchase. It cannot purchase you salvation. cannot buy you Christ Jesus. Get involved with God. Sow into his kingdom. Be part of what he's doing in the world today. In order to save souls. Get involved. So that when he comes, you will not be left behind. You will not be so engrossed with the things of the world. As the Bible told us, it will be like that day when Noah was called to enter into his ark. It will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. When Lot was taken away and the entire place was completely wiped out. Think about your life. Stop playing games. And wake up and say, yes. I will be part of what God is doing and what he will continue to do. The fourth thing concerning this covenant, the relationship of the church to the new covenant. What is the relationship of the church with the new covenant? Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew 26. Look at 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see what the, Jesus said there? The new covenant was sealed with his blood for the remission of our sins. Because we are engrafted into the kingdom of God because of the blood of the Holy Son of Jesus, Son of God, who brought us in. People who have no God become people who know God. We are taken in because of him. Because the covenant was sealed with his blood. And that's why you and I had opportunity to be called sons and daughters of God. And the Bible declared in the book of John chapter 1. In verse 2, as many as received him, he gave them power to become his children. You have received him as many as are led by the spirit as sons and daughters of God. Because of the blood. There is power in the blood. Come with me again in the book of Mark. Book of Mark, chapter 14. Mark 14. Look at verse 24. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. This is the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for many. And that many, you, are, you and I are involved. We are the ones who inherited this because that is where we are related to the new covenant because of the blood. Without the blood, you and I are not in any way involved in this very new covenant because it was a covenant made for Israel. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ that brought us in, that we all become part of this very covenant that God has created for you and I. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 6 through 13. The book of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 through 13. 
But now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry, in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Who is that mediator? Jesus Christ. He is the one who mediated for this better covenant, which carries better promises. In verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place will have been sought for a second. Which means the first one was not faultless. It has some fault. Because if it were faultless, there would be no room for the second covenant. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He will be their God, and they shall be his people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his, his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Look at the word God has spoken. God said he will be merciful to their sin, unrighteousness. And all their lawless deeds, their sinfulness, God said, I will remember no more. Verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first absolute. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. It is gone. Because the first covenant was faulty. So a new one was made sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The new covenant was made with Israel, but we also enjoy the benefit of it. Israel did not accept Christ, the blessing of the covenant. So God brought out the church and the mediator. Still, it will be made good for Israel. At your time, you can read. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 and verse 29. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. Romans verse, chapter 11, verse 17. Remember, the church is not in the millennial age now. So the complete fulfillment of the new covenant is still future. We are not yet under the thousand years rule of Christ. So this covenant is still future. It's going to happen soon. And that's why we are warning, calling upon people to begin to reason this world and everything in it will pass away and vanish away like a vapor. Therefore, why do we like to build our castle thinking that, well, this world is where we're going to be? It's going to pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. Why can't we begin to live life that will prepare us for the second advent of Christ? Prior to that, for rapture. Is it not good for us to get prepared? If you're not prepared, you'll not be going. That's why in the book of Amos chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible said, God said, because I am going to do this to you, O Israel, prepare to meet your God. Are we prepared? That's the question. Are we prepared? The way we live is like, here is a permanent place. The way we live is like nothing is going to happen. The way we, we live is like, well, I've made this place my home. 
I remembered what the Bible told us in the book of Acts. When the preaching was going on, turn your Bible a moment in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Look at verse 31. Or let's start from verse 30. It says, Truly this time of times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius, an Aeropagite, a woman named Demaris, and others with them. And the same thing happened these days. As we read in the book of Acts chapter 17 from verse 30 through 32. The more we talk about the end time, the more people say, we will hear them say it again. Some will say, we've been hearing all this news for many years. Some will say, well, Thousand years ago, we come to hear this. Nobody takes God serious because we are thinking, well, we've been hearing all this. He's coming, he's coming. When is he going to come? We've been hearing this. The world is going to come to an end. When is it going to happen? This is exactly what we see here. Oh, we'll hear it again. And people make mockery of the gospel because we become hardened in our hearts. We become people who don't want to hear the truth. Now, when we look at the eschatological implications of the new covenant, at your time, when you read the book of Ezekiel 37, verse 21 through 28, oh, let's go the moment, Ezekiel 31. And 37, please. Verse 21 through 28. Then say to them, Thus said the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there. They, their children, and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Now, as we look at this end time prophecy concerning this very new covenant, we can see what the Bible said. God said he will gather, regather Israel from wherever they have been scattered. As you know it, the Bible said concerning the 70th, Daniel 70th week. The Bible made it clear that the Antichrist, who will be a wise man, intelligent person, a prudent person, but cunning, 
will sign an agreement with the people of Israel. That agreement will be enforced till the middle of the seven years. After three and a half years, there will be a war. Because he will enter into the temple to make himself like a god and there will be a war. Then he will invade Israel and scatter Israel all over through the wilderness and the mountains of Jordan. So they will be scattered everywhere. But God said he will regard them again. He will bring them back. They will be regarded. Israel will be one nation ruled by one king. And that king is King Jesus. By one king. It will not be two nations. It will not be broken into pieces anymore. But it will become one nation. Israel will be no more or no longer be idolaters. All the sin they've been doing, you know, they're very prone to idolatry. Very prone to it. Very common. They begin to worship idol. They find something to worship. God said they will never be idolatrous nation anymore. But they'll be cleansed for and forgiven. God will cleanse them. And they'll be forgiven. Israel will dwell forever in the land which God had given to Jacob. After they are regarding, they'll be dwelling in that land. The land which has caused a lot of problems today. That land will be their land. No man, no one can take it away from him. Take it away from them. They'll dwell in the land that God has given to their forefathers. God will have a covenant of peace with them. So Israel will have a covenant of peace. There will be no more war. So covenant of peace will be made with Israel. They will enjoy peaceful time. A blissful time. Because Christ is ruling. Because they have been cleansed, forgiven, brought back, regarded again to worship the Lord their God. God's tabernacle will be with them. The sanctuary of God will be in their midst. No more, not in any place else, elsewhere, to be in their midst, in the land of Israel. Israel will be known among the Gentiles as a nation blessed of God. Even today, without any iota of doubt, no nation on this planet Earth doesn't know that Israel is blessed, that they are a real blessed nation of God. But that time, every nation, even those who choose not to know, those who try to pretend, they will know that Israel is a blessed nation of God. And people will go from all over the world to go there to worship. We're not going to have two gods that time. There's going to be only one God. Worshiping the Almighty God. Everyone will go down to worship the Lord. At your time, when you read the book of Zechariah, especially verse 14, I mean chapter 14, at your time, you will see a lot of things that God has spoken concerning Israel. At the time when you go home, read Zechariah chapter 14. There are a lot of things about end times that God has spoken. That will encourage you to live right. That will encourage you to be one of those faithfuls that the Lord will call, call the faithfuls. That will encourage you to live life of victory. Life that will bring glory to the name of the Lord. No more life of manipulation, deception. Follow what I say and don't do what I do. Such thing will never exist anymore. You begin to look into your own life. You ask this question to yourself. What will be of me if the Lord were to come today? What am I going to be? Who am I going to lean on if I'm rejected of the Lord? Suppose at that moment you say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. All the pretenses that you have been doing all this while will be exposed. Why must mankind die in a useless form, when God had made provision for your salvation. Why can't we live right? Why can't we be sincere and honest people? Why can't we shun evil, shun wickedness, and embrace righteousness and attributes of God? Why can't our year be you and never be no? At the back, we talk something else. When we go in front, we say something else. 
Why can't we be people that God can trust? People God can say, yes, these are my servants, my children. As I always say it, when I read through how God introduced Job to Satan, God said, have you seen my servant Job? No man like him, a man who shuns evil and embraced righteousness. A blameless man. Have you ever thought about what would be God's testimony about your life? If you were to be called out and God said, I want to testify of you. Look at the testimony of Moses. The humblest man in the face of the earth. Very humble. What about you and I? We are full of arrogance. Yet we claim to be Christians, claim to be servants of God, claim to be, we claim so many things, as I always say. Reputation is what people say you are, but character is what God knows you to be. Any man can call you, oh, you're nice, but what does God say you are? What about Enoch? The testimony of God concerning Enoch. It's time, God's people, for us to begin to look the way we live. Let's stop deceiving ourselves. Thinking that, well, people might not see, but God sees you through. I always say, it, heavens have eyes, the walls have ears to hear. All those conversations that until nobody knows. Jesus is the unseen guest. A silent listener to all conversations. Begin to look into your own life. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who came and shed his blood at the foundation of this new covenant. And he's coming back personally to earth to effect the salvation, restoration, and the blessings of the nation of Israel. He himself is coming to enforce it. That the people of Israel will be blessed, restored, forgiven, cleansed. And receive their salvation from the Lord. The will of God is not for anyone to perish. But for us to turn around and say, I want to be part of this new covenant of God. I don't want to miss it. I want to be part of this new covenant. I want to be among those who be called the faithfuls. Those who choose not to compromise. Those whose garments are pure and clean. Those whom the Lord will say, yes, come in you faithfuls. What about you? We have received all these teachings that are supposed to make us to live right and work right and be honest people in our work, in our words, in our actions, in our deeds, in every aspect. That In the church, outside the church, wherever you are, you represent Christ. Many of us are like lamb in the church, but outside we are like wolves. Let's be real. Take off that garment that come from Satan. God was so merciful to Joshua. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, in verse 3 and 4, he said, take off the filthy garment and cover him with garment of rich, richness. Robe of richness. Robe of righteousness and uprightness. Same thing God said to you today. Will you turn around? And become a brand new person. Become a new person. I share small thing in a small gathering. After sharing that thing, less than five minutes, a lady walked off and went and confessed her sin because she was convicted. God's people, God convicts your heart, He doesn't condemn you. Will you from today and say, enough of evil. I choose to live for God from this moment. I choose to live for God. I choose to be a living testimony. The past is over. From now, I'm going to live right. I'm not going to be part of evil, part of gossip, but part of destroying people's life. But I'm going to be part of those who enjoy and inherit the new covenant that God has provided for us, as we are going to see it soon, very soon, we are going to have it. 
Think about your life. God did not bring you here to condemn you, bring you for you to change, turn around. Be a living testimony. Be a person that God can be proud of. Be a person that wherever you go, any man, any woman who sees you will know that you are an exception. That you really carry the fragrance of Christ wherever you're going. You're diffusing the fra fragrance of Christ because you are waiting for the fulfillment of the new covenant sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May the Lord have mercy on us as we continue to listen to his word and be willing to obey and to follow. When you hear the voice of God, you know how to be Father. Let's turn on our feet.